So this YouTube video is explaining dysmetria. It's part of a three series. The first is on proprioception. This is the second and the third is on ataxia. Three neurological terms that are really quite closely connected, but I think um, it is useful to try and separate them out so that we can better understand them. So what is dysmetria? Well, in English, it means wrong length. Um, that's the literal translation. But actually, from a neurological point of view, it means an abnormal rate, range or force of movement. So the rate or the force of movement is also important as, as, uh, as well as the range. And it really describes um, how movement isn't coordinated properly. And of course, movement has to be very finely tuned. In the first lecture in this series, we talked about how proprioceptive information is carried out from up from receptors in the muscle spindles, um, the um, tendons and uh, and in the from the joint capsules and that information is carried up the spinal cord and then integrated in the cerebellum so as to precisely control movement and hypometria is one of the changes that you can get when that information that is coming up is interrupted or isn't integrated properly so it's something that's seen in spinal cord disease and something that is seen in cerebellar disease because of where the lesions are, you may also get an increase in tone of the muscle, which I am also going to discuss here, which we refer to as spasticity. And if you get a combination of hypermetria, which is a kind of overshooting action, then uh, you will uh, that increasing tone will actually make that overshooting into a kind of goose stepping action, as in the goose stepping uh, type of march that you can see in some countries. Hypermetria, on the other hand, is decreased rate, range or force of movement, and it's characterized by an undershooting, so um, meaning that there is a, um, a reduced range of movement. So we see hypermetria this lack of control and overshooting of uh, limb movement in three circumstances. Cerebellar disease, uh, high cervical lesions, which is C1 to C5, and also in T3 to L3 lesions, although this will just be of the pelvic limb. And this will look different um, with these different lesions. So, we have to remember that the movement is coordinated by the cerebellum and it also will uh, initiate movement, decide on the range and the force of that movement and then control and refine that movement. So the first thing that you see with a hypermetric movement with cerebellar disease is that the onset of movement is delayed and then it's excessive. So it kind of gives a burst of activity. And this is due to lack of Purkinje cell inhibition. The limb is raised too high in protraction with uh, excessive joint flexion. So this is a, uh, a still picture from a video. And you can see here that the limb is raised up high and there's flexion through all of the joints. You can't see the elbow here, but you can uh, appreciate that this is flexed. Uh, right um, and, and flexed at the carpus as well. Um, this is much more apparent when you do more complex manoeuvres. So if you have a dog which, or a cat which is very mildly affected, then you're more likely to see it if you have them say, for example, go upstairs. And in fact, many of these animals will refuse to go upstairs because they cannot coordinate their movement. Then when this limb is placed down again, it is again returned to the ground with increased force and increased extension due to that lack of control. Remember, I think of the cerebellum as like a dimmer switch. You have your basic light switching on, but then you have a dimmer switch that can control precisely um, the degree of light. The other way to think about it, if you're a certain age like me, is a very old fashioned radio where you um, used to have one dial to take you to the general bandwidth, um, which would be your movement, and then another dial which would fine tune it to give you the actual uh, bandwidth that you wanted. In comparison, Hypermetria seen in upper cervical lesions is dysfunction of um, uh, or interruption to the upper motor neuron and the general proprioceptive systems. So you don't have that burst-like movement uh, because the, this isn't uh, affecting 
or isn't a, a reflection of Purkinje cell uh, a lack of inhibition. Um, they have a kind of overreaching floating limb uh, gaze. It kind of extends further forward and takes longer to get there during the protraction the start of the of the of the gate usually the joints actually an extension so you don't get this flexion that you're seeing here and you particularly notice of, it, of the thoracic limbs but of course it will um, in a high cervical lesion you will also see it in in the pelvic limbs by comparison in um and t3 to l3 lesions this is also disruption of the upper motor neuron and the general proprioceptive systems uh, but this is just the pelvic limbs so you, you notice that the pelvic limbs are further reaching underneath the body and that also the joints are uh, in extension. There may be increased tone there. So it's time to talk about tone uh, because this is really an integral part of, uh, 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 of a hypermetric gait. Often the animals have increased tone as well. So it gives you this kind of, uh, unlike the Jack Russell Terrier we saw in the last image, which had the joint inflection, um, th this dog here with a cerebellar lesion has this goose stepping gait. So you have flexion of the elbow, but the distal joints, because of increased tone, are, are, are held in rigid I extension. So uh, what what is the cause of increased tone? Well, this we have to go back to very basic um, physiology. And if you remember, the muscle spindle is this receptor that is also important for proprioception, but it monitors muscle length and the rate of muscle changing. And that information goes up into the spinal cord. And of course, um, it also goes up to the cerebellum. This is the, the proprioceptive feedback from the muscle spindles help the, the cerebellum gauge muscle length and tension during movement. But it, there is also a stretch reflex. So this is a feedback loop that causes the muscle to contract in response to the stretching. Of course, that's what the patella reflex is. We hit the hammer over the tendon that stretches that um, that that tendon, uh, and then we get a, a a flexion of the quadriceps muscle. However, the cerebellum is um, is also um, acting on that muscle spindle and when you have a cerebellar lesion then you have an increased muscle sensitivity to stretch and as a result you get an increase in muscle tone. The cerebellum is also feeding back onto the motor pathways uh, and will uh, affect those but the upper motor if you have an upper motor neuron injury itself just of the upper motor neurons which are also feeding down onto that stretch reflex then you can get this exaggerated uh, muscle spindle response again a hyperactive stretch re uh, reflex so again you get hyperactive reflexes with an upper motor neuron lesion in some instances and again increased tone so um, increased tone um, uh, when we rule out primary muscle disease um, is due to either cerebellar disease influencing that that tone or uh, damage to the upper motor neuron uh, feedback on that muscle sp spindle so what sort of hypermetrias can we see? So here's um, uh, two examples. This is hypermetria of the left forelimb due to a cerebellar infarct. And it's a rather nice video because it really shows you the comparison between the normal and the abnormal in this dog because it is an infarct that just affects one side of the cerebellum. So you can see how that left leg is lifted up and it is all joints are flexed in comparison to the more to the normal um, right thoracic limb. You can also see how when that dog turns, we just see it walking down here again, and then turning at the top here, we can sh see how that uh, in that more complex movement we can really see an exaggerated um, protraction of that. Uh, that limb. And you may say, well, how else do we know that this is a cerebellar problem? Well, this dog also had an ipsilateral menace deficit. Of course, the cerebellum coordinates the menace response as well. And it, they may have, not in this instance, um, but they may have a contralateral head tilt with a, a, a lesion in this, in this area. Here's an, another example of cerebellar uh, hypermetria. So you can see in this dog who has generalized cerebellar disease because of the inherited metabolic disease L2 hydroxyacidurea and that this dog has an intention tremor. As you can see there as he's going for the biscuit, 
and here is this uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier walking and you can see with the increase in tone this dog has a much more goose stepping type gait um, with uh, doesn't have that sort of classic flexion that we saw in that uh, greyhound uh, and in the first image it's much stiffer action which uh, gives it that um, uh, goose stepping type action of particularly of its of its forelimbs and again you can see the the the, the handler there is circling the dog uh, so as to make um, s to see that uh, action a little bit um, in more detail just going to repeat that video again in case you didn't see it well the first time so you can see the intention tremor there which is characteristic of cerebellar disease and then in the video we see that hypermetric action it's also affecting the pelvic limbs which you can see a wide based which is characteristic of a cerebellar problem and she turns the dog just so that we can really see that hypermetric action as she's turning him So here we have hypermetria due to a spinal cord problem, and this is a lateral L2, um, C2, C3 disc extrusion. And not surprisingly, it's on the right, and you can see this, this hypermetric action looks a little bit similar to the cerebellar. And it is unusual for spinal disease to see flexion through all of the joints, but it can occur. You can also see the pelvic limb action that is also hypermetric but more classically you can see it coming uh, that her uh, pelvic limb on the right side comes far underneath her body and is quite stiff And this was her lesion here, so we can see what looks like a relatively small disc protrusion here. You can see the dehydration of the um, nucleus pulposa in here. It's a more normal nucleus pulposa at these levels. We can just see this bulge here of the annulus. And when we look at the uh, uh, image from the transverse view, we can see that actually it didn't look so so bad there but when we see it here we can actually see there's quite a, a fair spinal cord compression um, and it, it really is uh, much to the side and there was a torn piece of annulus in there that was pulled out um, and we can see why this was affecting the uh, uh, general proprioceptive tracts here because we can really see that these are on on the side where the where the disc was extruding and, and, and compressing in this dog the dorsal um, and ventral spinal cerebellar tracts are here and that's uh, conveying the uh, proprioceptive information from the trunk and the pelvic limbs and then we have the um, spinocuneocerebellar tract which is taking information from the, uh, the cervical region and the thoracic lesions so something that is compressing the spinal cord up in this region can damage that uh, area so how do we tell the difference between these two they, they look relatively similar well um, when you have a spinal cord lesion um, as in this dog that we just saw you have a conscious proprioceptive deficit as well because it will be affecting those conscious proprioceptive tracts ascending tracts um, which we have um, here so we have um, the fasciculus cuneatus which is taking information again from the cervical region the thoracic limb so this is a, an overlap area between the spinal cerebellar region and also in the spinal medullary region um, here this is uh, very close to the spinal cerebellar tract uh, and that is taking that conscious proprioceptive information so <coughs> the uh, um, the fact that there is conscious proprioceptive deficits will distinguish it from the cerebellum because conscious proprioception information does not go to the cerebellum and with the cerebellum 
or uh, cerebellus, uh, we will have other signs that will localize it to, to it. For example, tremor, menace deficits, that sort of thing. When else can we see hypometria? Well, um, and when do we see hypometria? Well, hypometria isn't really in any books. We, um, a lot of them talk about it, but we don't give very specific examples. But this, I think, is one of the most common examples. This is where you have lower cervical disease. So we can see hypermetric action of the pelvic limbs. And then this sort choppy gait, which is due to nerve root compression and weakness um, uh, of the thoracic limbs. And this is a very characteristic gait for Wobbler's syndrome. Um, and we have two giant breed dogs here. And here's another one with another very, very classic. Now, some people call these two engine gates, which is not an appropriate term, um, but that's partly because it looks like one so the, the control of the thoracic limbs is different to the control of the pelvic limbs. But this is a reflection of hypermetria and spasticity in the pelvic limbs and then weakness and nerve root compression in the thoracic limbs. So what sort of lesion causes that? Well, this is um, uh, usually disc and, and osseous associated wobbler syndrome. They have it both at the same time. Um, and this is this this is the great uh, um, Dane. And again, you see this rather innocuous looking disc protrusion here. Uh, it doesn't look so bad, but we do see this area of high signal in the cord above it. When we do a cross section through here, oh dear, no, this spinal cord is now in a triangle shape due to the compression of the bone here. And this is a, 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 an image which shows you how much excessive bone can occur on these facets and what was happening in these in this dog so this is a more normal it's not normal but it's a more normal facet here and here is this massive protrusion of bone compressing this dog's uh, spinal cord and also impinging those nerve roots so the other instance where you may see hypermetria is really where you just have weakness uh, and um, uh, of those limbs and so you have reduced range of mo movement but i'm not sure that this is exactly the same uh, um, description as you might expect uh, compare um, when we compare that to hypermetria which is very much a disorder of general proprioception and um, and cerebellar dysfunction so dysmetria is usually hi actually hypermetria um, we uh, with hypometria not really being commonly recognized um, at least in domestic animals uh, it's an error in movement scaling um, and uh, in the, in the case of the cerebellum, it's caused by a loss of Purkinje cell inhibition, um, leading to a de delayed initiation of movement, followed by an excessive burst of movement. Uh, and then you, and you have a high protraction with excessive joint flexion and is often accompanied by cerebellar signs, for example, tremor and menace deficits. Whereas spinal dysmetria results from a combination of upper motor neuron and general proprioceptive dysfunction, and they have more of a floating gait during protraction, and the joints are typically in extension. Thank you very much.